Fetal alcohol syndrome is not the whole universe of folks who've been damaged by alcohol exposure during pregnancy. Fetal alcohol syndrome is a birth defect syndrome and it's defined like any other birth defect syndrome. Fetal alcohol syndrome is defined by some evidence of growth deficiency, a very specific set of facial features, and evidence that the brain is damaged and dysfunctional. And then those three things are seen in the context of confirmed alcohol exposure in pregnancy. So that's fetal alcohol syndrome. Now the most important part of that condition is obviously what's going on with the brain. The brain is structurally altered, frequently at a level that's microscopic or microcellular. And it results in a broad pattern of dysfunction. Problems with memory, planning, attention, IQ, achievement, social communication, and on and on. About half the kids, as best we can tell, have IQ scores below 70, and so they're intellectually handicapped. But actually, the ones who have the hardest time are those with an IQ above 70 because they're still absolutely as maladaptive in life, but they don't qualify for services with an IQ score. Now, it doesn't really make any sense that an environmental agent like alcohol would only cause a specific syndrome because alcohol exposure can occur in different amounts, at different times, in different ways, against different genetic backgrounds. And so you'd expect actually a spectrum of people with all sorts of different problems. And that's what we find. And we find that the brain problems are the most common single thing that occurs in folks that have been exposed to alcohol in pregnancy. Those individuals who don't have all the features of fetal alcohol syndrome but do have evidence of brain damage in the context of alcohol now fall into a group of conditions we call fetal alcohol spectrum disorders or FASD. Now the rates of FAS and FASD in Canada are not specifically known at this time. The North American rates, largely using data from the United States, would suggest that fetal alcohol syndrome, the whole thing, occurs in between one and three births per thousand. And the rate of FASD may be as high as one in a hundred. This certainly puts this condition at epidemic proportion. In Canada, we would estimate approximately 4,000 children are born annually with fetal alcohol syndrome. It's also been estimated that there is a cost to caring for a child with FASD of approximately one to three million dollars over their lifetime above the cost of caring for anybody else. If we set the cost at a million dollars and we talk about only FAS, that means that there is an increasing burden to Canadian taxpayers of approximately four billion dollars a year to care for people with fetal alcohol syndrome. Beyond the price of caring for this condition, uh, this is a lifetime disorder. It leads to incredible pain and suffering for folks who have it and for their families who endlessly are struggling to figure out how people with this complicated brain problem can fit into society. Clearly, we need to help individuals who have this condition and help them in health and in mental health and substance abuse and education, employment and so on. But wouldn't it be much better if we prevented it? You have to ask the question, why in this day and age would anyone do an irrational thing like drinking heavily during pregnancy? And the answer lies in the fact that why would people do irrational things? Maybe there's something else going on. In our studies of looking at the birth mothers of children who had fetal alcohol syndrome, we found that those women were drinking voluminously because of a whole bunch of other issues in their lives. There was a very, very high rate of abuse, physical abuse and sexual abuse, over their lifetimes. They were isolated. They had fetal alcohol brain damage about half the time themselves. They would go for mental health services and would be told that because of their brain damage and because of their substance abuse, they should go seek other kinds of care first. They would go seek those kinds of care and be told they needed to deal with mental health first. They wouldn't get any care. One gets the sense that they were out using alcohol as a partial treatment for their own substantial mental health problems. And when do we take the best care of such women? When they're pregnant. It's when they see physicians and other healthcare people the most. 
It's when they're told they're doing a, a good, decent thing. And so we have the cycle of alcohol as a self-medication. We have to understand this and break the cycle. We have to identify this group of women, see them as patients themselves, and offer them the help they deserve. That helps them, and it will also reduce the rate of other individuals with permanent, lifelong birth defects.